Okay. Welcome everyone to the October meeting of the Comsoc Video Conference. Our speakers today are Jewa Chen of TU Vienna and Connell Duddy of University College Cork. We'll be following the usual format, a 20 minute presentation with uh, 10 minutes after that for questions, followed by a 10 minute uh, coffee break with uh, optional uh, breakout rooms that you can join, and then the next presentation. Uh, I'll ask you to mute your mic during the presentations. If you have a question that you want to ask, the, the uh, method is to type the word question in caps into the chat box. Um, and we'll make sure that the, um, the uh, speaker gets to see that at the end of the talk. Um, uh, I think that's pretty much it. Um, so our first speaker uh, is Jawa Chen. And I had her topic written down. Uh, she'll be speaking on fractional matchups under preferences, stability, and optimality. It's all yours, Jawa. Okay, thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Just want to make sure that everyone can see it. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. But I think your video is gone. Now? Yes. Okay, great. So yeah, thanks for the invitation. So I'm, knowing, I'm going to talk about fractional matchings on the preferences. Okay, so uh, what are fractional matchings? Let me uh, start with an example in time sharing scenario. For instance, uh, when students working together uh, to solve some exercises or um, freelancers working with some different companies or employees working together in shifts. Uh, for a concrete example, let me, uh, let's suppose we have uh, here six nurses a, B, C, D, G, and H. Uh, each nurse has to accomplish uh, a fixed amount of shifts, and each shift has to be done by exactly two nurses. Um, each nurse has um, uh, may find a, only a subset of nurses to uh, acceptable to work with each other. Uh, spe specifically, we assume that uh, this acceptability relation is symmetric, so we can use the so-called acceptability graph to model this. Um, in this graph, uh, we have uh, each vertex represents a nurse and there is an edge between two vertices if the corresponding two nurses uh, uh, would like to work with each other in a shift. For instance, uh, nurse B wants to work with A and C together, but does not want to work with B, G, or H. Okay, and um, what's more, um, each nurse also has uh, cardinal preferences over the acceptable um, nurses. So for instance, uh, and we use uh, mu x to represent this cardinal preference function for nurse x. Okay, so here the higher the better. Um, so for instance, um, um, nurse B may, find, uh, may, has value, may have value three to nurse A here, three and uh, one to uh, nurse C. So uh, this means that nurse B prefers to work with A over with C, but he does not, she does, as I said, she does not want to work with D or G or H together uh, at all. And to visualize this uh, cardinal preference function, I can just label the edges with the corresponding cardinal values. For instance, three here means mu B of A equals three. So now uh, for this specific time sharing scenario, the task is to somehow determine uh, which two nurses are going to work together in a shift, uh, taking into account the cardinal preferences of the nurses, of course. And let me just remark here or uh, just emphasize that uh, the scheduling of the shifts is not important. What is important here is that I wanted to know whether uh, uh, we, we are interested in the satisfaction of the nurses here. So uh, specifically, we, we, we want to avoid that uh, the, sh the nurses uh, rematched after we assign these uh, shifts. And um, because this will, for instance, produce uh, extra chaos. So specifically, we wanted to um, maintain some kind of uh, stability, okay? So working in shifts can, for instance, be modeled by the so-called uh, fractional matching. So what is a fractional matching? It is a function that assigns to each edge uh, a value between zero and one in such a way that uh, for each nurse, so for each vertex here, the sum of the uh, fractional values is at most one. 
So for instance, if each nurse has to do uh, at most six shifts, a value uh, for an edge to have a value uh, one third, this means that uh, the two nurses in the edge will have to work together in two shifts, okay? And uh, to be, uh, so for instance, um, an integral matching is a special fractional matching where at e each edge has value either zero or one. So zero means uh, not working in any shift together and one means working in all shifts together. Okay, so this green, ad, uh, this green matching, for instance, indicates a, a inter integral matching. Um, so for the um, classical stability, so for integral matching, uh, an integral matching is called stable if uh, no two agents will form a blocking pair. So they do not want to walk, uh, they do not, uh, so no two agents prefer to be, to work with each other rather than with the agents uh, or, or the nurses assigned by the, the, by the matching. So in the integral sense. Now for the fractional matching, uh, a blocking pair would mean that uh, the two nurses uh, or the two vertices would prefer to work more with each other because we now we have fractional values. Okay, so to, um, they would prefer to have more fractional values towards each other. Okay, so before I, of, of course we have to now define what does it mean to have more values or would prefer to more war with each other. Before I go into details, let me just, uh, just I already uh, said about uh, agents. Let, let me just use agents to refer to the vertices or nurses in, uh, during the whole course of the, of the talk. And I will also use edge or pairs interchangeably. Is there any questions so far? No. Okay. So indeed, there are, Sorry, I, I hear my echo. I'm not sure whether it is my problem or. So this is uh, Frank. Can you switch off your microphone? I don't manage to do it for you for some technical reason. Okay, sorry. Okay, so uh, let me just continue. Um, so there, there are many, uh, indeed many ways to extend uh, stability for fractional matchings in the literature, uh, maybe the most straightforward one would be, for instance, to just use the linear relaxation of the classical stability constraint. In this talk, uh, we are going to uh, see two more interesting ones, uh, ordinal stability and cardinal stability. Um, so for um, ordinal stability, uh, only focus on the ordinal part of the cardinal preferences. So um, it requires that for each two agents, X and Y, at least one of, the, one of them has to be fully matched to the uh, edges or pairs that are better or equal to this specific pair. So here fully matched means that uh, summing up the fractional values, it must be uh, one. So one of these agents has to be at least one. And better than or equal relation between two uh, edges are simply derived from the cardinal preferences. Okay, so this uh, is for your, uh, so this is the uh, formal definition. Okay, so intuitively, um, if an edge or if two agents X and Y that do not satisfy these two constraints, this, um, uh, neither of these constraints, this means that uh, X and Y would prefer to work more with each other. So increase their uh, mutual fractional values for this specific pair by possibly decreasing some of the uh, fractional values of the edges that are worse. Okay. Mm, uh, for cardinal stability, so there's another uh, concept called cardinal stability. Cardinal stability assumes that each agent has a linear utility. So the linear, linear utility is defined as the sum of the fractional values weighted by the cardinal preferences. Okay, this is the uh, utility, for instance, for agent X, and this is the utility for agent Y. And it requires that at least one of the agents uh, for each pair must have a utility that is at least as large as the cardinal preference of the agent towards the pair. Okay, so 
uh, intuitively, this may be a bit more relaxed in the sense that suppose X has a very strong preference against uh, or towards another agent, let's say Z, with, for instance, value 10, then having a fractional value for X and Z with, uh, for instance, 110 would be already enough. Yeah, so th this would be equivalent to having a, for instance, a fractional value between X and Y for, I don't know, one. Yeah, so if, if X does not, uh, does not have a very strong preference over this pair. Okay, so I think this is, uh, to, to better understand these two concepts, let's look back at uh, our example again. Um, you may, uh, first of all, you may ask yourself, why do we bother to look at a fractional matching? So why do we, why don't we just use integral matching? First of all, fractional matching give us uh, more flexibility. For instance, we can maybe share with other partners so we can have more partners. This is one thing. And the other thing is that uh, you may recall that uh, integral stable matching does not always exist. So for our example, for instance, if you look at this uh, green uh, integral matching, you can see that it is not stable. For instance, A and C may form a blocking pair. So C prefers A over its partner, D, and as well for A, okay? So indeed this example does not have any integral matching which is stable. But if we relax ourselves to have uh, fractional matchings, then the situation changes. So look at this uh, red matching, for instance, it is a half integral matching. So for the, uh, the dash red edges re represent a half uh, 0 0.5 value and the solid edge is, uh, has value one. Okay, so it's a half integral matching. So what about the utilities? So these are the derived utilities for each agent. For instance, for agent C here, this uh, lower part, it is three times half plus one times half. So it is two. Okay, so for this, for instance, this integral, uh, half integral matching, uh, it is cardinally stable. Okay, so if you look at, uh, look at this edge again, the utility of this agent is true and it is uh, larger or equal to the cardinal preference here too. And the same for, two, uh, for A as well. So you can check or you, or you can just believe me that this uh, half integral matching is cardinally stable. Um, what do we know more about this half integral matching? Well, every agent is fully matched. So everyone is quite happy because he, he works, uh, is fully matched. Um, and the social welfare, uh, which is defined as the sum of the utilities is 11. And this is the maximum that you can get. Um, if you look at the weighted matching, so each edge has weight, uh, which is the sum of the cardinal preferences, actually the maximum weight matching has also uh, this value, so 11. Okay, so what about the ordinal st uh, stable uh, stability? Um, unfortunately, this uh, half integral matching is not ordinarily stable. So uh, the reason is that if you look at this edge D and G, okay, so for your convenience, this is the definition of being a, a ordinarily stable matching. Uh, this edge D and G uh, form a, an ordinarily blocking pair. Okay, so um, remember uh, for, for, the, for agent D, for instance, if you look, uh, if you sum up all the matching values that are better than or equal to this edge, only this edge, so it is half, so it is sm smaller than one. And this is the case for the, for the other agent. So none of the term is satisfied, so it is not ordinarily stable. Now the question is, you, you may ask whether the, uh, there exists uh, uh, an ordinarily stable matching for this example. Yes, there exists. For instance, this blue, um, this blue matching. And this matching is half integral and it is ordinarily stable and cardinally stable. Uh, you can just believe me. And, but if you compare these two um, half integral matchings, you may figure out that or it is easy to see that uh, for this matching, not every agent is fully matched and the welfare is only 10. Okay. So now um, you may ask, so what is actually the relation be between these two 
uh, stability concepts. And um, so if you look at the definitions of these two con uh, concepts, you may figure out that it, or it is pretty straightforward to see that ordinal stability implies cardinal stability. And to see this, uh, you can, uh, if, you, if you multiply, for instance, for this term, both hand sides with the cardinal preference mu x of e, then this term implies this term and the same for, the, the, for this uh, right term. So this is the reason why ordinal stability is a, a stringent or a more restrict um, requirement for uh, as a cardinal stability. And, um, but if you restrict uh, to integral matchings, uh, ordinal stability and cardinal stability uh, coincide and they are equivalent to cl cl the classical stability concept. But this is in general not the case. So if you uh, remember from our uh, example, the first or the red matching is cardinally stable, but it is not uh, ordinally stable. Uh, what do we know more about these uh, two concepts? Well, um, it is already known from the literature that when uh, the preferences do not have ties, uh, an ordinally stable and OSM it always exists. And it is even a half integral matching. So this is quite good, uh, it's, a, it's a very good news. Mm, indeed, we can it extend this result to the case with ties. Uh, what do we mean by ties? Uh, ties means that uh, an agent has, uh, has preferences, um, or I don't know, uh, an agent may have uh, the same cardinal preferences over two different uh, agents. So we can extend the third result to the case when there are ties. And, uh, and such kind of uh, ordinal stable matching can be found in linear time. So this is actually a very good news in the sense that if you uh, remember for the integral stable matching, first of all, we do not always have a, a so there, there is not, uh, there, there's, there's not always an integral and stable matching. And finding one is actually MP complete. And if we relax to fractional matchings and ordinal stable matchings always exist and we can find, it, uh, find them in linear time and uh, because of the first result and it is also a cardinal stable matching. Now the question is that, okay, um, this is uh, already, or this is not maybe not a question. Now we may ask ourselves, um, or you can you can look at uh, by a, or if you look at our example again, you see that um, ordinal stable matchings or cardinal stable matchings may not be unique. So now to compare these uh, uh, two different concepts, we look a bit more into uh, the optimization variance. So we can for, uh, we look at specifically two optimization problems. The first problem aims at maximizing the social welfare. So the sum of the utilities. Specifically, we wanted to know, for instance, for ordinal stability, whether there exists an ordinal stable matching, OSM, with uh, utility, sum of utilities at least gamma. And for um, the second uh, optimization problem, we wanted to know, for instance, whether there exists an ordinal stable matching and OSM with at least tau fully matched agents. And we can uh, analogously define the problems for cardinal stability and for the marriage case. And marriage here means that uh, the underlying acceptability graph is bipartite. Okay. So let me just remark there that uh, the cardinal um, uh, maximizing social welfare is has been introduced by Kahajianis in their easy paper in 2019. And the problem of maximizing the number of fully matched agents is inspired by the work of uh, Menlov et al, uh, where they studied uh, the problem of finding a stable uh, matching with ties with ca uh, maximum cardinality. Okay, so a little bit about uh, more about the related work. Uh, first of all, uh, fractional matchings is a generalization of the uh, random matching um, where each agent must be fully matched. So uh, random matching is a fractional matching where each agent is fully matched. 
And um, a mixed matching is a fractional matching, uh, or a fractional matching is a mixed matching if it can be rewritten as a linear combination of uh, integral matchings. So this is in general not the case. For the marriage case, this is, uh, so mixed matchings and fractional matchings are uh, the same. But in general, it is not the case because uh, if you look at the graph, there are maybe, maybe some odd cycle and odd cycle cannot be, not, not necessarily rewritten as a linear combination or distribution over integral matchings. Okay, um, so um, extending the classical stability for fractional matchings has already been, uh, or ha there has already been work on this kind of research already since the 90s. Um, but the work is mostly on the simple linear relaxation of the stability concept. And um, Ross et al. has also worked on the ordinal stability concept, but also, but only for the, um, the marriage case, okay? So um, um, ordinal stability can also be, or fractional matchings can also be extended to hypergraphs. Um, hypergraphs uh, where, uh, the, uh, where the agents may have preferences over hyper edges. So hyper edges are subsets of uh, vertices. And uh, Ahaboni and Fleiner has shown that uh, there is always an ordinal stable matching even for the hypergraph. But finding one is pipette complete, uh, which is shown by Kintali et al. and Ishizuka Kamiyama. Okay, I don't have more time, I think. Some problem with my okay. Um, just okay. What? Uh, let me just use uh, two minutes to summarize our work. So um, we've looked at uh, structural properties for ordinal stable matchings. So we have shown that if preferences do not have ties, um, for the marriage case, ordinal stable matching has a lattice structure, and for the roommate's case, uh, it at least satisfies the median property. And we have uh, then after that we have looked at uh, these, uh, the computational complexity of these two optimization variants. Um, and in general, we found that op uh, optim uh, ordinal stability is computationally easier than cardinal stability. And most hardness reads, but uh, in general, both problems are computationally intractable. But, and most hardness results hold even for the special case with, uh, for the marriage case without ties. And we have done some approximate, uh, approximation results, for instance, for maximizing the number of fully matched agents. Uh, for the ordinal stability, we have two approximation results. Okay, so let me just skip uh, the algorithm for maximize, uh, so uh, the algorithm. I don't have enough time. Okay, so let me just uh, summarize. Um, maybe I, as a follow up or so potential follow up for our work, uh, we will be interested in the parameterized complexity for our problems, for instance, for parameters that uh, uh, characterize or um, spe uh, spe specify the, uh, the the, uh, the solution, for instance, the, the welfare. And we will also be interested in whether uh, we will obtain some tractability results uh, for the special, when the preferences have some uh, sp special structures, for instance, single pigments or uh, Euclidean preferences. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Joa. Shall we all unmute our mics and give a round of applause? Um, the questions start with a line uh, that um, Janik began about whether any additional constraints are necessary to do something like actually form a schedule. Janik, you want to ask your question? You can. Uh, yeah, me? sure. Um, can you hear me? Uh, wait a second, I'll switch. Yes. Okay, just the motivation with the nurses seem to be more like mixed matchings and not the type of fractional matchings. Since to decompose the fractional matchings, you would need additional constraints in the roommate's case. But you right? cannot you cannot use mixed matchings for fractional matchings, especially if you do not have bipartite graph, and this is not possible at all. It, it's not equivalent, but the motivation seemed more like you want to have a 
set of matchings each for the probability instead of having the probability being over the edges. If if it is possible, then you can rewritten it as a, rewrite it as a mix mix matching. But the motivation is that I can just look at the individual pairs, and I wanted to know whether it is possible to have some. If you just look at this individual pair, and for the nurses, we do not necessarily have bipartite graph, so we may not even uh, be able to find any mix matching at all. So I don't see that why, why this uh, motivation, or maybe I. So so. Thank you. So what do you do with this uh, functional matching? That's what I'm trying to get at. Like, what, what do you yeah, do with so this triangle if edge, everyone has 0 0.5? So everyone has a 0 0.5 means that I can spend uh, half of my time uh, with some nurse or with some agent. And this is not but, necessarily the case if I have bi uh, not have a bipartite graph. If, if you just look at an odd cycle and 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, you can never be, you can never uh, decompose it in uh, via distribution over integral matchings. Yeah, that's why I'm saying that's why I want to, to ask if it wouldn't be more natural to look at the distribution directly instead of the probabilities on the edges. But look at this uh, odd cycle. You cannot do this. I can say I spend half my, my time with you and half of my time with the other guy, and then the other guy uh, spend half of time with each other, but I cannot do it if mm -hmm. I just look at I, the, I think uh, we are talking in the wrong direction. So I wanted to ask if why don't you look at the case where you have a probability distribution over the matchings? Yeah, you can look at it. This is a special case that, of fractional matching. Okay, uh, but can I you ask also confused. just, sorry, I, I'm confused like Ariel about the interpretation of the triangle. You have the triangle one half, one half, one half. So in practice, yeah. it seems to me that when they implement that, it's going to end up two third, two third, two third. No, I mean, if we do one pair uh, at random, yeah. uniformly, they, it's not really one half, one half. It's uh, two third. No, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where the one half. Uh, I mean, I understand where it comes from uh, mathematically, but I, I think so I think if uh, you look at this blue matching, this uh, this lower part. I can say these two agents work together in half of the time, half of the time, half of the time, but you cannot say in a matching, uh, I have one matching that consists of one edge, half, one matching, one half, one half, then it is not a mixed matching at all because it's sum up to 1.5. I, I think you can do so, it, for example, you, so you, you uh, spend half the shift, A and B yeah. spend half shift, mm -hmm. A, C half shift, and A and B, C half shift. So each agent so two shift, two shift. of your whole, spends a, an entire shift together, but with two different agents. And the benefit of looking at this is that you can maybe uh, have more social welfare or you can make more people happy by giving more jobs to people because uh, this is never possible for uh, mixed matching. Uh, there was a different okay. line of questioning, I believe, started by Magnus. Magnus, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Uh, yeah, I did get an answer in the chat, more or less, but uh, my question uh -huh. was about the, the cardinal stability. Well, I didn't quite see how that really is a form of stability, since it seems an individual agent could still wish to rematch. And as yes. Sanjukta uh, says, you could do that and get a higher social welfare. So, I mean, stability, as you said, initially stability is, you, you want stability to prevent that kind of chaos. You don't want people to find rematchings between themselves and for, with the cardinal stability here, it doesn't seem like you are preventing that. I, I just didn't quite understand that part. So it could be the case that one agent still wants to increase, but as long as the other agent does not want to cooperate, then it's fine. So if you look at the utility, it, I'm already happy if, if my total ut utility is at least two. So if I'm C agency, my total utility is at least two, I'm already very happy. Although I'm not necessarily matched to A, agent A. I just, I will work half of my time with D and half of my time with B and together I have a utility of T, uh, of two. And this is at yes. least two for uh, but, and, uh, but my point is that that is a linear combination. So one mm -hmm. of my, one of my current edges may be below two. 
Uh, and if I remove that and switch that part over to the other edge, I will end up with more than two in total. So that's what I don't And understand. the other agent does not necessarily want to cooperate. Not necessarily, so, course, but you don't, you don't prevent it. But this is the, the space for stability as well. It. For stability is also, I, I may want to be totally matched with, uh, so I may prefer some other guy, but if the other guy does not want to deviate, I, then yes. that's too stable. Yes, absolutely. So this is but, a but that system. isn't, that is, I, ju I, I just didn't see that in the criterion. Because you just, for, you say that for one, uh, well, or I may just be misunderstanding. Because the Sanjuta says that it is possible, as I say, that you could switch over. So I, I uh, maybe no, no, no. I think the the answer was that you can increase social social welfare by relaxing to cardinal stability. Because ordinal, so if you are restricted to ordinal stability, maybe this is, uh, although there is still one, as you see for the blue matching. But now everyone is happy. For instance, the last guy is not matched at all, and the social welfare is lower. And if you relax to have more flexibility to allow for cardinal stable matchings, you can on the one hand, increase your social welfare because you allow more fractional uh, matchings, more solutions. And on the other hand, maybe some more people will be, will be happy to work, uh, to, yeah, to have oh. more jobs. Yeah, OK. Yeah, it seems there was a misunderstanding. It might not be possible, it says. But the fact that mm -hmm. it might not be is not really a guarantee, though. So I, I just, mm -hmm. like, let's say that both, both agents have a current utility that is at least as high as their value for the edge, but both of them also have one edge with a small fraction that is lower than their current utility. Then they would yes, be, it's always both be interested to that in edge. dropping that and taking the same fraction of the shared edge instead. They would get a higher utility and they have then broken this so-called stability, uh, unless I'm misunderstanding, that would make may, it, sorry, may it add seem something unstable. Yes. So may, yes. may I add something here just to clarify. So the, the notion of cardinal stability says that you either abandon your fractional um, allocation and you match with somebody deterministically, so to speak. So if you and I prefer our match to our fractional allocation, we match to each other, but we don't you know, reallocate probabilities. So basically, you're allocated something in expectation, let's say, fractionally. I am allocated something fractionally. We can abandon that and form a blocking pair, the two of us. And this is prevented. This is what shouldn't happen if you have a fractional statement. Ah, uh, yes, I see. Because the application here wasn't probabilistic. It was time yes. slots. So that's what, what yes. made it confusing to me. But if it's probability, I understand. I love the definition of this discussion. Yeah. But the previous discussion here was specifically that it was not about probability, that it was not mixed matching. So there seems to be a conflict yes. there then. Yeah, maybe I would say probability might be uh, a bit tricky to define it as probabilities. I mean, effectively, you can think of them as probabilities. The only problem is that then it would have to be that you get ex ante stability. So you have to, you know, because when you realize the probabilities, let's say in the bipartite case where you can decompose, the problem yes. is that you don't guarantee against what happens exposed. It's only an ex ante stability notion. So I wouldn't necessarily call it probabilities. I think call it fraction no, no. probably better. Sure. But sure. the point is that you you safeguard against deviations of people like you know people against each other, just a, a pair yes. of people yes. matching yes. to each other, basically. Yes. But, but 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 if we look at the application here, which was essentially not fractions of a matching in that sense, but the number of hours, which is a fraction of the total time then you're not preventing people from rescheduling a certain fraction of their time rather than abandoning yes. the entire thing. So but that, that's, that's, that's entirely, confusing. yeah, that, that is true. Yeah. yeah, that is true. But what I would say is that what you're suggesting is more like a more like a core outcome, which is more demanding than a stable outcome. So you, you want to safeguard against maybe more complicated coalitions that, you know, you just maybe use just fractions here and reschedule fractions. So yeah, it's not the same notion, but I, I see what you mean. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So let me just remark, if you look at maximum welfare's uh, cardinal stable matching, for instance, you cannot uh, just say, I want to reschedule because if you reschedule, then some other guys' uh, welfare will be, or utility will be decreased. 
you can you can yes, build yes. on top of all kinds of cardinal stable matching you can find one which is optimal for instance maximum welfare or the number of uh, fully matched agents is maximized i, I just mentioned this is also the metric sorry. motivation where we look at uh more more requirements yes i i just meant if the motivation here was to disincentivize people from changing their schedules on their own it doesn't seem to work in the application you're uh, providing that was all yeah, this is the Just first people. step. So we wanted to like extend the stability for fractional matchings. And one thing that we can do is to look at the cardinal preferences and the utility. And you can, of course, build on top of that and require more. Folks, we are, we are running uh, somewhat short of question time. I want to make sure that oh. if anyone has any uh, questions on, along a different line, they have an opportunity to ask them. So please pipe up if you have any uh, other questions at this point. So I think Ihre asked some questions. Did you look at the problem of finding a stable matching in which the number of fractional edges is minimizes? Can be easy. Uh, this is Errol. Ah, yes. Uh, so Errol, do you want to ask you? Yes, I mean that the fractional matching, you... when there are many fractional edges, it may be from an administrative uh, uh, mm -hmm. perspective, it may be hard to, to, manif to maintain. So maybe. Uh, we, we can look for an, a stable matching where, the, where, where as, as few edges as possible are fractional. So did, did you look at That's this? That's an interesting question. Uh, not necessary. Um, I, I think not. Okay. Okay, everybody, I guess it's time to move on to our um, official break. So this, this is... 10 minutes during which you can uh, us in one of the breakout rooms that Dominic will be organizing and we'll uh, reassemble in about 10 minutes. Uh, let's thank, uh, let's unmute and thank the speaker one more time. Before we do that. We start. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Our next speaker is Connell Duddy. He'll be discussing fairness and random assignments. So, Connell, share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you see this here? It's good. Great. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I want to talk about the random assignment problem. So in this problem, you have a group of people and a set of objects, the same number of objects as there are people. And ultimately we want to give one object to each person. Each person has a strict preference ordering over the objects, but the objects are indivisible. So to achieve fairness, we will have some randomization in our method. And so our method will produce a random assignment, which gives a probability to each person for each object. Now, for a long time, there wasn't much interest in this problem because I think because there was a solution that seem, is very simple and seems ideal, and it's called random priority. And the idea is that you would place the people into a random order, and then one by one, you would give to them their favorite object of those that remain. This seems fair and efficient. But then in 2001, you have this very important paper by Anna Bagamonaya and Hervé Moulin where they show that random priority is not so fair and that it's not even really efficient. And they propose a new solution. So we'll just see why random priority isn't fair. It's not fair in the sense that it's not SD NV free, where SD stands for stochastic dominance. So at this profile here, if you were to apply 
random priority, what you'd find is that person one would have a one third chance of ending up with their least favorite object, C, because that's what they'll get if they're the last person in the random order. On the other hand, person three has just a one sixth chance of ending up with C. Even if they go last, they may or may not end up with C, depending on who goes first. So it's possible that person one may feel envy towards person three, right? What if person one really dreads the thought of receiving object C? They might wish that they had that one sixth probability instead of one third. So maybe the method isn't really fair. And it's not SD efficient either. Here at this profile, if you apply random priority, you find that person one has a 5 twelfths chance of receiving A and a 1 twelfth chance of receiving B. And then it's similar for person two here in reverse. But this is not efficient, right? Because it would be better if you would give this 1 twelfth chance of B to person two and then give this 1 12th chance of A to person one. So random priority fails to be efficient. So then uh, uh, they propose this new method, the serial rule. And there has been a lot of literature on this rule in the last 20 years. And so here the idea is that you have an eating procedure where the people eat the objects in order of preference everybody eating simultaneously and all at the same speed. Now this method is SD efficient and there's good reason to feel that it's extremely fair too. The random assignment that you get is always SD envy free. And this is arguably the strongest envy freeness concept that you could possibly have in this setting. So it really is perfectly envy free. And there's another reason to feel that it's extremely fair. Um, they show in that paper that every SD efficient method must correspond to some eating procedure. Now, eating procedures are deterministic, but they can vary from each other in that you can assign different eating speeds to different people at different moments in time. The serial rule is based on that special eating procedure where everybody eats at the same speed the whole time. So what could be fairer than that? But I am troubled by the output of the serial rule at a particular profile, I'll show you. So if we apply the serial rule here, uh, what we'll find is that persons one and two begin eating object A because it's their favorite and they manage to eat half each. Then during that same time, person three eats a half of B. In the next moment, person one starts to eat from B now that A is exhausted. So after a quarter of the time unit passes by, person one eats a quarter of B and person three eats another quarter of B. And at the same time, person two has eaten a quarter of C. So now C is the only thing that's left. So all three people will eat from C. In the final phase, they'll each eat one quarter of C, like that. So I'll show you why I am not happy with this random assignment. So here it is again on the left-hand side. This is what we just calculated, the output of the serial rule. And as always, it's envy free and efficient. But we could have this other random assignment here, which is also envy free and efficient. And I think it's fairer. We give a probability of a half to each person for their favorite and a half to each person for their second favorite. To underline why I feel this is fair, fairer, just imagine that we begin with this random assignment and then we move instead to the output of the serial rule. What we would be doing is taking a quarter of probability away from the second favorite of person three and moving that up to that person's favorite object. But then by equal measure, we must take a quarter of probability away from 
the second favourite of person one and move that down to their least favourite object. How can we justify doing this? It seems unfair. So this motivates a new uh, fairness concept different from no envy. Now in the literature, there is another fairness idea. There is a paper from 2018 by Christian Bastak. Here we have the idea of the SD core from equal division. Now I won't go into detail about this, but I'll give you the gist of it. The idea is that a random assignment is fair if it could have been reached by people trading probability with each other, having started from a position of equal division. That is starting with one nth probability for all n objects. So we can consider those uh, random assignments with this other fairness criterion. And we find that the output of the serial rule actually satisfies these SD core conditions. Whereas the, one, the random assignment that I like doesn't actually satisfy them. But this just makes me more motivated to develop a new fairness criterion, right? Now, just something I should point out here is that the serial rule does not satisfy the SD core criteria in general. It just happens to at this profile. In fact, Bastek shows in one of its results that when a group of four people, SD and freeness and these SD core conditions are incompatible. So here's a kind of an overview of these interpretations of fairness. You have the most important one in the literature is envy freeness. That's the one that completely dominates the literature as a concept of fairness. And then you have this uh, newer one, the uh, core criteria. I want to suggest that there's a kind of libertarian character to the SD core cri criterion. I don't really use this word literally, I just use it loosely to give you a sense that it's a different way of thinking about fairness where you might emphasize consent or something like that. The idea that you would have people trading probability and that envy freeness by contrast has a kind of egalitarian character to it. But one thing that both of them have in common with each other is that they are based on purely intrapersonal comparison. Of course, this is a big reason why no envy is such a popular concept of fairness in the fair division literature, because it is purely intrapersonal. Maybe that is the genius of the idea of envy freeness is that it is intrapersonal. So what I want to do is suggest an egalitarian kind of fairness concept, but I am willing to commit the sin of interpersonal comparison. And I think that this can be defended. And it's what makes a difference. Now, in a way, you already saw me make an interpersonal comparison. When we looked at those random assignments earlier, I compared person one and person three. So I'm going to generalize that kind of approach. Um, so here's my a basis for a limited kind of interpersonal comparison. I want to assume that every person receives the same amount of utility from their favorite object that every other person receives from their favorite object, and that every person receives the same utility from their second favorite object that every other person receives from their second favorite object, and so on. Now, of course, that's unlikely to be true, but I don't really mean this as a positive claim about the utilities of the agents. Instead, I want to make this assumption for the sake of fairness. I think that it's right that we should base our approach to random assignment on this assumption. We should proceed as though it were true, irrespective of whether it is or not. So it has an, a normative basis rather than a positive one. So based on this idea, there is a limited kind of interpersonal comparison we can make. So here I'm willing to say that person I has better probabilities than person J if the following is true. 
if person I's probability of receiving something from their top K is at least as great as person J's probability of receiving something from their top K for all values of K. And if that's strict, sorry, if that inequality is strict for at least one of those values of K. So in that case, I will say that I has better probabilities than J does. And that's how I will denote that. So then this kind of comparison, limited as it is, it allows us to formulate a kind of maximum egalitarian uh, principle. So I will say that a random assignment P is inegalitarian if there is some other random assignment P prime, such that at P prime, everybody has better probabilities than some person J has at P, right? And um, so uh, this, when I say everybody, that includes J, individual J himself, okay? So the idea is that at random assignment P, we are failing to maximize the well-being of the worst off person. So it's inegalitarian. So our, um, our egalitarian principle then says that we should never have an inegalitarian random assignment as our output. We've already seen that the serial rule violates this principle. We saw that in this example. So on the right, we see that all three people have better probabilities than person one has at the random assignment on the left. Okay, so there's a more general kind of uh, result here that I have. So this is like a, a key result about this egalitarian principle that when you have a group of five people or more, uh, SD envy freeness is incompatible with the egalitarian principle. Um, so what this means then is that we must develop um, a new uh, rule for random assignment different from the serial rule if we want to satisfy this egalitarian principle. So to help me to do that, I'm going to talk about a paper from 2015 by Anna Bagamalaya. Um, let me first give you some context for that paper. So the classic form of the random assignment problem has agents with strict preference orderings. But you might be interested in a variation of that problem in which people have weak preferences. And so in 2005, you have this paper by Kata and Sathuraman, where they extend the serial rule to the case of weak preferences. It turns out to be quite tricky. They have to develop a kind of complicated algorithm that involves uh, multiple max flow network problems uh, in order to get their random assignment. Then in 2015, Anna Bagamalaya takes a different approach to the same question. She shows that the serial rule can be defined in a way that doesn't involve an algorithm. The serial rule maximizes a special kind of lexeman order over random assignments. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, that lexeman order over random assignments can be easily extended to weak preferences. And so this gives you a more uh, elegant, simpler way of generalizing the serial rule to larger preference domains. What I want to do here is suggest a different lexeman order over random assignments. Okay, so I'm going to try and explain the original lexeman order from that 2015 paper. Okay, so here we have two random assignments on the left hand side, and we want to compare these against each other. We want to rank them according to this lexeman principle. In order to help us do that, we construct a special table for each random assignment. 
the special table just shows the same probabilities, but in a kind of cumulative form. So like in this second row, you're seeing each person's probability of receiving something from their top two. And in the third row, each person's probability of receiving something from their top three. These tables make it easier for us to apply the Lexium in order from that paper. So once we've constructed these two tables, all we have to do is find the lowest number in each table. And whichever one has the greatest lowest number wins. Okay, so in the first table, the, the lowest number is one half. And in the other table, the lowest number also is one half. So it's a tie. To break the tie, we just look to see what's the next lowest number in each table and we compare those. So here we have a half again and also a half here. So it's still a tie. So we just look to next lowest number again. Here we find it's three quarters and here it's one half. Well, three quarters beats one half. And so that means that this random assignment is the winning one. And sure enough, the output of the serial rule will always win in this kind of comparison. That's one the central point of that paper, one of those key points. So I want to uh, suggest a different lexium in order over these uh, random assignments. So here we have the same two random assignments, but this time what we're gonna do is compare the tables by focusing on one row at a time. So we begin by only looking at the first row of each table and we identify the lowest number in each first row. So here we have one half and here a half as well. So it's a tie in the first round. So this time we break the tie by moving our attention to the second row of each table and identifying the lowest number in the second row. So here we have three quarters and here we have one. So this time one beats three quarters. So the random assignment that I like is the winning one this time. Maybe you can see how you would have continued this sort of comparison if it had been a tie, right? So in general, the idea is that you if you have a tie in the second row, you would go on to the third row, you compare lowest numbers in the third row. If it's still a tie, you'd go on to the fourth row and compare lowest numbers in the fourth row. If you go down through all of the rows and find the same lowest number every time, then you would return in the end to the first row again, and this time compare second lowest numbers. And you'd move your way down uh, the rows comparing second lowest numbers. If you find the same second lowest number in every row, you would return to the first row again, now comparing third lowest numbers. You stop the moment that you find a difference, right? As soon as you have find two different numbers, then the comparison is resolved. So my proposal for this uh, rule is that we should maximize this other um, uh, lexeme in order. So uh, this is just meant as a kind of quick summary of the difference between the two lexeme in orders. With the serial rule, the idea is that you can simply list out all the numbers in the table. And you can do that for another table and then compare the two lists of numbers by the lexeme in principle. Whereas what I'm suggesting instead is you would take the table and you could write each row in a non-descending non non order from left to right. And then after you had done that, you would begin comparing numbers beginning up here. And if you have a tie, you would move, make your way down through this first column. And if you have ties all the way down, you would move to the second column and work down through that one and so on. Okay, so that's the idea for a different um, method of random assignment. So I'll stop there. Okay, thanks very much. Folks, let's unmute our mics and uh, thank Connell. Um, let's see, we have um, 
a question from Ulla that I think may have been in effect addressed. Ulla, why don't you uh, unmute and tell me? Yeah, when you first started talking about your minimax principle, I thought, um, could this be generalized to a Leximax principle? But in the end, I think maybe that's what you did already. And uh, so I think when you defined it for us in the beginning, the principle you just talked about in the, the uh, your your probability of getting something from your top set that you compare top item, you compare that. But I think if that's equal, you go on comparing the second one. I think that's what you what your algorithm in the end does. So I think yeah, that. yeah, that's right. I guess um, there's kind of two things at play here. One is the rule, which kind of takes that maximum idea and extends it to Lexeman and gives you a complete ranking of where all random assignments. But then there's the more cautious um, criterion that I set out, the egalitarian criterion, which is more conservative and only is just a kind of max min kind of uh, principle and it's not even based on a complete uh, relation we have this very limited kind of interpersonal comparison for the egalitarian principle so there's kind of two things there there's the more conservative criterion and then there's the rule which goes much further and develops into a full lexeman order thank you Uh, let's see, Rashef had a kind of a challenge, I think, to your notion of fairness, Rashef. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe another way to phrase it from the way I, I put it in the comments is that um, if I'm looking at your example, I don't know if that generalizes to all possible examples, but it seems that um, in the in the the first solution that, that, uh, that you showed, kind of the classical solution with the uniform eating rate, those who are getting hurt, uh, who, who don't uh, end up uh, like getting everything they want, are essentially those uh, that have, uh, that impose more a negative externality on the others because uh, they want kind of the highly demanded uh, uh, products or items. So it makes sense that they don't get all they want. Um, yeah, yeah, this is an interesting argument, actually. It's a lot like the argument that Christian Bastak makes in that paper I referred to. He makes a case for this other kind of fairness, this idea of the SD core, and that a random assignment should be obtainable through a kind of trading amongst people who begin with equal shares. And he makes exactly that same kind of argument about there you refer you use the word externality, the idea that you know people who you, you might have a very popular object and lots of people have it as their favorite. And under my kind of egalitarian approach, they maybe get too much. Maybe it's too kind to people who have very popular kinds of preferences. And sure enough, the SD core kind of libertarian way of thinking about fairness would be along the lines that you described. So I do think there's a kind of a difference in how you can think about what fairness means, whether you think about it in that kind of, as I, I'm, I'm using this term libertarian kind of uh, perspective that I think the SD core criteria represents, which then is different from the kind of egalitarian idea that I want to just spread, uh, you know, probabilities as evenly as I can, um, even if that means that I'm, you might, you know, from the libertarian perspective, I might be taking too much away from people who have unusual preferences and who otherwise might do very well. Is that, does that kind of address your question? I... Uh, yes, I think uh, exactly. So I stresses the need to, I mean, the word fairness is just uh, too general. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, so if you take it to more like philosophical, uh, <laughs> yes. take a step backwards. So I, I think Jonathan Haidt, who's a psychologist, uh, he's, uh, he's studying uh, morality and how people treat morality. And he's developing these different flavors of morality and argues that some are more common in certain societies and so on. 
and he reached a sort of problem with fairness because even though people behaved completely different on these experiments, they all said that they care about fairness. Mm. And in the end, like he ended up splitting it into two different, like very different notions of fairness that roughly correlate with what you call libertarian and, and egalitarian okay. um, that are emphasized you know, in different cultures and, and different societies in a very different way. Yeah, that's very interesting. The, the word fairness is, is a problem because people yes, it's open sometimes mean exactly yeah. the opposite using the same word. Yes, yeah, that's right. Thanks for that question. Yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question? I mean, to elaborate a bit on, on Reshef's, um, if you take the simple type of profile where N minus one people agree A better than B, better than C, better than D, etc. Mm -hmm. And only the last person has exactly the opposite uh, preference. So is the uh, odd, odd bird out. And by efficiency, it seems to me that whether it's the PS or whether it's your solution, it's going to give us the same uh, proper mm -hmm. thing. I mean, that the, the odd person will get everything of this last, um, this, this commodity that nobody wants except him and so forth. Yes. So, so your solution uh, in that sense does exploit um, efficiencies. It is SD efficient, right? I mean, uh, yeah, that's, right. that, that's, that's true. Yeah, so, it's right, it's, it's just that it refuses any intensities. I mean, it refuses to accepts the idea that your step from first to second or second to third is is more important first to second than second to third or, or vice versa mm -hmm. i mean they, those sort of ideas uh, I, I guess really uh, are, no are, are not there i mean uh, yeah it, it's it's very yeah it's very natural to me, it's very natural. It's a bit like, you know, it's Borda versus, uh, you know, it's a Borda type idea, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> you are counting scores. Yeah, that's right. In the same way that the border rule seems to make a kind of interpersonal comparison that seems to equate people's utilities or something like that, or there's some kind of aspect of that. And, right. Uh, yeah, I think you're right that the serial rule and this other rule, this kind of egalitarian rule, they, they take the same position in a way on what we were talking about earlier, that kind of they are, are take a kind of egalitarian view of what fairness might mean. But the serial rule is, I think, because it's based on the no envy idea, it, it's based on a kind of pure intrapersonal uh, view of um, the well-being of the agents, maybe. And so the, the oh, difference, true. I think, comes about in that there's two, there's the whether you're willing to make the kind of interpersonal comparisons that I'm willing to make or not, maybe is a kind of critical point of difference. You know. But it's interpersonal comparison of just uh, ordinal ranking uh, objects. Yeah. It's, there yeah. is no cardinal utility uh, anywhere right i mean that's right yeah we so i'll say i'm willing to say everybody gets the same utility from their favorite thing everyone gets the same utility from their second favorite thing but i don't say anything about how much more utility they get, they get from their favorite than their second favorite so i don't say anything about you know the gaps between first and second just that there's a quality across these ranks right yeah right Right. Oh, it's, yeah. Harris and nice. Dees had a somewhat different line of questioning. Harris, did you, do you want to pipe up? Sorry, it's uh, very late here. It's almost 1.30. So um, uh, I just wanted to ask about uh, whether the rule is weak SG strategy proof. Um, uh, I don't think it is, would have any strategy proofness properties at all. Um, not even weak strategy proof which PS that holds. Oh right. So is it, does that mean that uh, you can obtain something that is like stochastically dominant over your original probabilities? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure actually. I don't know that. Does uh, does seems the serial? Like, have, have... Seems Felix has a response to that in the chat. 
Okay. Yeah, I don't think it can be strategy. Yeah, I may be incorrect here, but <clears throat> I think there's this characterization by um, Heavy and Anna for three objects. Um, then PS is the only rule that is um, envy free and weak strategy proof and um, efficient. Yeah, but that's so probably for SD envy freeness, right? Oh, okay, for three agents is fine. That's, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I think it probably doesn't have um, that strategy proofness property, but I haven't checked that. Um, and uh, one other thing I, I was wondering about was that uh, this seems very well behaved when you have uh, equal number of rows, meaning that the preferences are strict, but when you have indifferences, then since you're focusing so much on first equivalence law, second equivalence laws, mm -hmm. and the, the sizes may be different, I was wondering if you've looked into this issue more, whether it yeah, makes um, a lot of impact. I, yeah, I haven't really looked into it. It's a good question. You would have to try to adapt that idea that people get the same utility from their favorite objects. Well, what if somebody is indifferent between things? Um, I haven't really developed um, the rule in that direction. So I don't know how easily it would be adapted to, is there a kind of natural counterpart for a weak preference? Um, I don't really know that, but yeah, it's, an, it's a good question. Thanks. Dominic, you had a point you wanted to make? Not really, I was just saying, I don't think the new rule is NV free, so the characterization doesn't tell us immediately about energy proofness. Oh yes, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Isn't it envy free for three agents, this rule? Um, oh, actually, it might be. Uh, I, I suspect it is envy free for three agents, actually. Yes, I think it would be. Um, I know it isn't when you have five, um, but uh, for three agents, yeah, I imagine it probably is envy free. Uh, so then the result would apply, I guess. Um, yeah. Any other it doesn't questions? seem, sorry, sorry. It doesn't seem complicated to include indifferences given that you do those summation, you know, those uh, summation of the top probability, probability of top, probability of second mm -hmm. top. It's just that computationally, it may be tricky, I yeah, think. Yeah. I, mean, I would be optimistic but... about that because that was the whole idea originally when uh, when Anna Bagamonaya developed this idea of the Leximan order of, mm -hmm. of random assignments. The whole idea was that it makes it actually quite easy to extend right. to weak preference. So that may, I would be optimistic that it could be extended easily to weak preference in mm -hmm. a similar way. I think computationally, you can easily do it via linear programming and most likely through network flows as well. Yeah. Uh, can your current rule without ties be computed more easily than via linear programs? Well, I actually did come up with a kind of an algorithm for it, which is it's based on the one that Kata and Saturaman had for their serial rule which is where you have a series of max flow network problems and you can you have to go through a whole lot of them but in the end you get the solution and it seems like it's a fairly natural kind of process in a way it's not but i don't i don't know very much to be honest about uh, algorithms and computation but the that max flow kind of algorithm seems like a natural fit for um, calculating that kind of random assignment. We have time for perhaps one more question, if there is any. If not, I think Ulu will tell us something about uh, next month's seminar. Yes, I can do that. So uh, Edith will share the next one, but she's not here today. So we're going to meet again on the 11th of November. So we'll continue with the rule that uh, Second Thursday of the month is reserved for the Comstock video seminar. We're going to have two speakers. Um, 
One of them is uh, Maria Kiropulu, and I think she's going to talk about things a bit related to the two talks today, envy freeness in the context of some lotteries and things like this. And the other speaker is Patrick Lederer, who will speak about uh, characterization of the top cycle with the help of strategy proofness. So that's all sounds very promising and I hope to see many of you there.